the communists. All socialist thought centers around the idea that private property is somehow an unacceptable social anachronism and should be abolished in whole or in part. When we think of modern socialism and the work done originally by anarchists, we are uh, unavoidably moved in the direction of the communists who uh, took over from the anarchists and actually became, both in purpose and in formula, the leading movers of the entire socialist movement uh, during the 19th century. And of course, we cannot think of the communists without thinking of the founder of modern socialism or communism, Karl Marx. There have been many biographies written about Marx, and it is not my purpose to go into that uh, phase of his uh, background. Uh, what I'm concerned with here is the development of socialist thought and the development of the communist movement as a means for promoting and expanding socialism. The first thing that we should keep in mind is that the idea of modern socialism was originally set forth by anarchists who saw, uh, as they looked at the world, it at least seemed to them that the greatest evil that we had was the evil of private ownership of property, and they saw uh, in the way that they looked at things that private property was only possible because governments existed and therefore, governments created a privileged class of people that had property. Ergo, the proper procedure would be to get rid of the government, at which point you would automatically get rid of private property. Karl Marx began as an anarchist. He was first influenced by the writings of Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, one of the foremost anarchists of the uh, first part of the uh, 19th century. However, Marx soon broke with Proudhon because he saw the inescapable flaw of anarchy. In fact, I can sum up Marx's position uh, very well by simply quoting from him. He made a statement that pretty well abolished the rationale for the uh, anarchist movement when he said, the owners of property will never give it up without a struggle. What he was drawing attention to was the fact that if the anarchists were successful in their endeavors to get rid of the state, this would make no difference whatever insofar as property is concerned. Marx detected that private ownership of property precedes the state and would exist if there were no state at all. And therefore, it was not the state that caused private property, even though the state had become an instrument of the private property owners. Instead, Marx counseled a revolution, not one aimed at abolishing the state, but one aimed at taking over the state so that the state would be a new instrument in the hands of the workers whom Marx called the proletariat. To understand Marxism, and that means to understand communism, you have to recognize that there are essentially four major points in the doctrine. And none of these points were original with Marx. Marx simply picked up these ideas from various people that he had read, and he wove them together into a new fabric, or what appeared to be new, in at least a strange and unique way. Uh, Marx is not original when it comes to either economic or social theory. However, he does have a degree of originality when it comes to political action. Politically speaking, Marx is very shrewd. Economically speaking, uh, Marx leaves a great deal to be desired, although he has been hailed as a great economist. In point of fact, his economic theories will not hang together. He is very faulty here, although many people as yet do not see that. Anyway, the four points within Marxism would be these. One, the abolition of private property. This is a major objective. That is to say, the abolition of the private ownership of property. And Marx got that idea, of course, fundamentally from Proudhon, an anarchist, but he also has a debt of gratitude to be paid here uh, to such men as Plato and others who predate 
uh, Proudhon, and uh, uh, who had also argued that uh, private property is the source of so much mischief and discord and inharmony. The next point in the Marxian uh, catalog of desirable goals would be the abolition of the family. Uh, Marx viewed children as, properly speaking, the products of society rather than the products of individual, particularly individual bourgeois families, where he thought the children were raised very, very badly, and he thought that there should be professionals raising the children. Uh, this is an idea uh, that he uh, uh, actually took from an early anthropologist uh, who had done uh, some remarkable studies in anthropology and who had concluded that uh, as long as you have families, the children will be raised in a climate where private ownership of property is important. I am referring to Lewis Morgan, who Marx mentions in his uh, notes and in his writing, and to Morgan's uh, a pioneer study called Ancient Society. Uh, in here, uh, Morgan fairly well demonstrated that uh, the family itself is sort of the matrix of the idea of private property. And therefore, as Marx saw it, if you intend to abolish private ownership of property, you're going to have to abolish the family. There must be nothing that comes between the individual, the family, and the state ideal. The third point within the Marxian uh, lexicon would be the labor theory of value. Uh, this is the idea uh, that all value, and indeed ownership itself, is a derivative of labor, and uh, uh, Marx sees this as a necessary uh, moral justification for the kind of thing that he proposes. Believing as he did that all value springs from labor, it seemed to him that individuals such as capitalists or employers or the management team as such really wasn't doing any work. They were simply engaged in profiting as a result of the labor expended by others. And consequently, since he saw value as a derivative only of labor, it seemed to him that exploitation was the common rule of the worker, and therefore all of the earnings should go to the worker, and he has no place for the capitalist or the businessman. Actually, he is a little bit ambivalent here, because what he says in Volume 1 of Das Kapital, he contradicts later in Volume 3, where he will allow the uh, businessman some justification, and possibly even a wage, but it would be a minor one, because although he will now confess that uh, businessmen also do a little labor, their labor is really unimportant, uh, but he's willing to pay them for whatever it is that they do of value. The fourth point is the one that has confused many people. It is called dialectic materialism, and whereas Marx borrowed the labor theory of value from the classical economists, notably from Jeremy Bentham and David Ricardo, when he came to dialectical materialism, he borrowed this from Hegel. Uh, Hegel, of course, was a Platonist, a man who was profoundly influenced by the early Greek philosopher, and uh, the manner in which he came to his position respecting dialectic materialism is somewhat oblique. Uh, Mark, Marx was uh, uh, trying to figure out um, how to justify his theories relating to the future of the world in a commune, a world commune, and Hegel explained in uh, something that he wrote, which he called the dialectics, um, how ideas are fashioned uh, from both uh, what was called uh, uh, the, um, oh, I can't, the, the, the word escapes me for a moment, I'll, but I'll think of it. Anyway, the, um, uh, there is a kind of an evolutionary process uh, by means of which there is first a body of thought which is then met by a second body of thought, and the two collide, creating a third body of thought, and this process apparently goes on indefinitely according to Hegel, uh, Hegelian theory. Marx picked it up and thought he saw within it the, um, uh, the concept of um, the justification that there is such a thing as historic determinism. And as he saw it, uh, the entire explanation of economics would fall into this idea of historical predeterminism, and therefore he was able to say as a result of his theories relating to dialectic materialism, 
that it is historically inevitable that communism is the wave of the future and that one day we will all be communists. Now, these are essentially the four points, the abolition of private ownership of property, the abolition of the family, the labor theory of value, and dialectic materialism. None of these, as I pointed out, were original with Marx. He borrowed heavily from others and he wove them together and that became the fabric of uh, new world socialism or communism. Now, the place where Marx was original related to his political theories. He saw the world divided between two dominant classes, the bourgeoisie, who were the property owners, and the proletariat, who had nothing but the shirts on their back. And there is a parallel line stretching around the earth between the upper and the lower class. As he viewed it, the government was the instrument of the bourgeoisie. And his idea, rather than abolishing the government, was first to organize the proletariat and have the proletariat execute a kind of end run in which it comes around above the line or breaks through the line, takes over the government, and then the government becomes the instrument of a new ruling class, the proletariat. Once the proletariat is in a position of power, it will use its power to extract from the property owners all of their property, notably what he calls bourgeois property, and then once all of the property is gathered in the hands of the government, then you could turn around and the government would simply redistribute to the proletariat and to everybody because at this time you would have a classless society because everybody, excepting the people in government, of course, who are excluded, everybody in society generally would be a member of the proletariat it would be a working class society in toto, and then they would receive according to their need. You remember the famous Marxist idea, from each according to ability, uh, to each according to his need. Now, Marx is paired in his career by the works of Friedrich Engels, uh, who worked with him uh, fairly closely. Engels was a mill owner and uh, a man who had resources, and he assisted Marx uh, decidedly in uh, his efforts to uh, write and develop his theories and to see that they were promoted. Marx also became a very active organizer of labor unions. He felt that the, uh, the whole future of communism related to the labor movement. In fact, if you are familiar with his writings, you will note that he is constantly exhorting everyone that is the workers of the world to unite. Uh, this is uh, uh, exactly the idea that he wanted to bring about, and it was the uh, union movement that he saw as the uh, organization that would help to um, make this happen. He was disappointed here because the labor unions that he assisted in organizing, he, he was particularly active in setting up one of the early unions in Germany, uh, these various labor unions, although they were theoretically a part of an international classless movement, nonetheless took on national characteristics whenever pressures arose. And Marx became increasingly disgusted and discouraged with the working class because they would not put aside their racial and their nationalistic prejudices and join in one great movement to overthrow the hated capitalist. Uh, he became increasingly disgruntled here his uh, dialectic materialism didn't seem to be working out. And incidentally, uh, the words that escaped me a moment ago uh, relate to uh, the, the terms thesis and antithesis and synthesis. I couldn't remember that for a moment, but these were the three steps in the creating of dialectical materialism. But they didn't seem to work out for Marx. It didn't seem to go the way he wanted it to, and he finally died a very discouraged and a very bitter man. Uh, he was followed in the communist hierarchy by uh, two other people uh, named Lenin and Trotsky, and they struggled for a long time to get themselves in a position of prominence where they would be the major leaders of the entire socialist front. Uh, they failed again and again. In process, they sought repeatedly to bring off uh, revolutions in Russia to overthrow the Tsar. They had any number of abortive efforts in uh, Russia to topple the government, and uh, every one of them failed. 
Uh, finally, uh, Lenin was exiled from Russia and fled to Switzerland, where he took refuge. Uh, so uh, his actions there were not successful at first, and his actions also in organizing all of the socialists uh, were not successful either. In fact, Lenin was having a very difficult time of it. The anarchists during this period were throwing bombs and getting most of the attention. But finally, shortly after the turn of the century into the 20th century, uh, Lenin and Trotsky uh, cooperated in holding a major conference in London, and in that same year, another one at Brussels. And in, on these occasions, they did bring together a great many people of the socialist persuasion, and the result was the forming of a new internationale with Lenin at the head of it. It is here that Lenin got the name the Bolshevik because he won majority support, and that is what the word means. As some people suppose that it's a special type of communism, it merely indicates the majority leader of the communist movement. And Trotsky became known as the Menshevik because he had the minority support. However, the Russian Revolution was still a long way off. And to everyone's surprise, and I presume uh, to the surprise of some of you who are listening to me now, uh, the first of the communist-type revolutions did not occur in Russia, although that is where most of the publicity has been centered. Uh, it actually occurred in the Western Hemisphere in Mexico. It began really in 1910 with the overthrow of the Diaz government by a politician named Madero. Madero and Diaz clashed, and uh, in the ensuing uh, discord and inharmony and confusion that uh, developed, a trio of communists, well, at least two of them were communists, and one was something of an opportunist, uh, put the pieces together to organize the Party of the Revolution in Mexico. The three to whom I refer were a man named Zapata, and then a politician named Carranza, and Pancho Villa, whom we think of usually as a bandit. Uh, these three put together the Party of the Revolution, which I might advise is still the only political party in Mexico, and Mexico is still following the ideas that they set down, excepting, of course, since that time, they have had to modify their position. An interesting point which should be brought forward here is this. While Marx was to see the failure of the anarchist movement from a practical point of view, in other words, he saw that if the um, anarchists were to be successful and government was ceased to, to, would cease to exist, nothing would happen as far as property is concerned because human beings will never give up their property without a struggle, and therefore your property situation would remain the same. And since the socialist revolution is to be a disruption of the property relationship, the destruction of the government would not bring that about. Therefore, Marx recognized the government as the tool that could be used to bring about this type of reorientation of the property. But the interesting thing is that the anarchists were able to detect the flaw in Marxism. And Marx couldn't see his flaw, but he could see theirs. And curiously, they could see his, but they couldn't see their own. And so here you have two groups of socialists, each one seeking to abolish private ownership of property, each one condemning the opposition for not being practical about it, and actually both of them being wrong, both in what they're trying to do and in the methods that they attempt to bring off. The anarchists pointed out to many communists and to Marx himself on at least one occasion that even if Marx were successful and he got the proletariat organized and the proletariat went in and took over and extracted the property from the then owners, it would only be a matter of time before those people in power having the property now under their control would be acting just like the previous owners. And therefore, you, you would not have a change at all in the management of property. You would simply take it out of the hands of certain property owners, transfer it into the hands of other property owners, and uh, the exact situation would be the same. A point, incidentally, which has been borne out with all of the communist revolutions, beginning with the ones in Mexico. Although Marx's ideas have often been politically and even militarily successful, they have never attained his economic objective. 
And since the entire movement of socialism is fundamentally geared to an economic objective, in that sense, Marxism has been a failure from the beginning, a point which many modern Marxists now recognize and they pay uh, scant uh, uh, lip service anymore even uh, to Marx. Uh, so this was what happened in Mexico when the uh, Carranza government took over. Carranza became the president, the first president under the Revolutionary Party. Uh, he instituted a kind of agrarian reform and the very ideas that Marx had recommended only to find the economy coming apart. Uh, everything uh, fell into a terrible depression and it is only in the last, uh, oh, possibly 20 years that uh, Mexico has been moving away from the economic disaster that was imposed upon them uh, by the communist theory that was imposed on them from the top. Meanwhile, uh, after Mexico went communist, which it still is today, although we have no uh, real problem with them because they are moving more and more towards a free market and more and more towards private ownership of property, uh, the second major uh, communist revolution occurred in China. I sp say the second. I'm speaking in terms of chronology and not in importance, but the second in time. This occurred under the leadership of Sun Yat-sen, uh, who was a doctrinaire communist and who, incidentally, uh, selected his general uh, from the University of Colorado, uh, an American uh, and a white man, although many people, because his name was Lee, thought that he was Chinese, but he is a white American educated in Colorado who went with uh, Sun Yat-sen to China and assisted Sun in overthrowing the Manchu dynasty. However, the new Republic of China founded by Sun Yat-sen lasted only two years. Uh, the uh, Manchus were engaged in a little conspiracy with uh, one of the leading figures of the Sun Yat-sen regime to be reestablished and... Uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen made the discovery that this was happening, and the result was an internecine war that broke out in China between the forces of Sun Yat-sen and Prince Sung. And in the ensuing conflict, the uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen was defeated. What had happened was that his general, General Li, who was a very brilliant man, became ill. He got pneumonia and was returned uh, to Santa Barbara, to the hospital there, and he never recovered. He died there in the hospital. Without his general, uh, Sun Yat-sen was not capable of defeating Prince Sung, and he lost the war and had to flee China, and he went to Japan for refuge. While there in Japan, he selected the two men who were to carry on communist ideology uh, in China after him, and they were Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. And for your information, in case you have forgotten it, uh, Chiang was later to be sent up to Moscow to study under Lenin, and this, this is Chiang Kai-shek, the man that we have backed in uh, his opposition to Mao, who is supposed to be the communist. Actually, <laughs> they both were communists, and uh, it's of interest, I think, that Chiang married the daughter of Sun Yat-sen, and Mao married the cousin, uh, so that uh, actually, in a sense, it was just one big family. The um, uh, there isn't time in so brief a discussion to uh, get into the details. The, uh, uh, the major communist revolution that we all think of, of course, is the one that occurred in Russia in 1917. Uh, what happened was that there was a palace revolt uh, right after uh, Christmas in the early part of 1917, and uh, a, uh, a small band of radicals seized uh, important offices in the palace in St. Petersburg, and then sent a telegram to the Tsar, who was visiting with the troops on the Russian uh, Western Front, uh, suggesting to the Tsar that he abdicate. And the interesting thing is that he did so. Uh, many people have felt that the Tsar was, was overthrown by force. Actually, he resigned. He resigned his post, which is probably something he didn't have to do. And... Uh, I, as a matter of fact, the group of radicals that had taken over these key posts were not at all prepared for this. They hadn't imagined that the Tsar would abdicate, although they had demanded it in a spirit of bravado. And so they found themselves in a position where they were trying to reorganize a new government. And it was at this time that Lenin returned from Switzerland and uh, offered his services in helping to establish Marxism from the top. 
But the new people there, a Prince Lvov, spelled L-V-O-V, and a man named Kerensky, did not want to try to put in Marx from the top. They wanted to have a democratic type of government, such as we have in the United States. And uh, this caused Lenin a great deal of anguish, and he broke with them and uh, went out and organized the faithful into a second revolution. And this is the so-called October Revolution, the ones that the Russians uh, commemorate each year, uh, which is the one that put Lenin in power. Yeah, Lenin overthrew the Kerensky regime and not the Tsar and chased Kerensky from the country. Uh, Kerensky fled uh, to the United States and uh, lived here uh, primarily in New York, although he did travel around and lecture in various places, including uh, Stanford, on the glories of socialism and the evil of communism. Uh, he died, I believe, in 1970, uh, in the first part of the year. Uh, meantime, of course, under Lenin, the communists gained ultimate, ultimate control of Russia, and then when Lenin died, although Trotsky was slated to be the next in command, uh, Stalin seized power. As secretary of the Communist Party, he knew where the bodies were buried, and there is some evidence that he kept his own uh, spade and pitchfork handy for just such occasions. Anyway, he, he sent a, uh, an execution squad to get Trotsky out of the way. Uh, Trotsky's friends found out about it and uh, intervened and managed to ship Trotsky to the United States. He came into New York, but um, uh, they sent for him from Mexico, where some of his friends were having difficulty with Marxian economic theory, and so he went down to Mexico to assist them there. And uh, as I'm sure you remember, uh, he, took, uh, he was given protective custody. He was put in jail, as a matter of fact, to safeguard his life, but the execution squad found him even there, and he was executed uh, in Mexico, where he was trying to help establish the communist regime there. There have been, of course, other uh, communist takeovers, uh, the one in Cuba being uh, perhaps one of the last or one of the latest uh, that we are very familiar with, although there has now been a, a rather a unique breakthrough in that a communist regime has arisen in Chile in South America by means of an election. And uh, so far as I know, that's the first time that's happened, that a, uh, a communist would come to full power without uh, anything at his disposal but an electioneering process. Anyway, the communists are very interesting people. In a, a presentation as brief as this, I have only touched very quickly on a number of points. I suggest that you read more about it. It makes fascinating reading. Thank you.